first saw The Evil Dead in about 1992 when I was 12. Uh, I saw it on VHS at a friend's house along with Evil Dead 2, Return of the Living Dead. Um, I watched most of The Evil Dead with my eyes shut, as I remember, but... Uh, you know, even even though it was the censored version, I still found it really scary, and it did have a big effect on me. And 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 in terms of both liking horror films and uh, wanting to get into special effects, film special effects. So, like in art class at school, um, I did a couple of things. I made an Evil Dead two cabin out of things like foam board, paper, and card, and sponge, and what have you. Um, and it had a light inside, so it would light up. Uh, and also, I made a uh, an amalgamation of uh, Jason and Ash in a figurine so he had a hand chainsaw and a shotgun in a book of the dead but also had a Jason mask. This um, combined with a uh, love of magic and illusions which I'd had much earlier in life um, uh, led me to start experimenting with my own special effects and it was very crude stuff. Towards the end of school I became friends with a guy called Will. He actually owned his own VHS camcorder and had made a couple of his own films at that point. Uh, he wasn't into horror, um, he was more into drama and films about relationships and the relationships between people and groups of people and things like that. Um, and obviously I wasn't into drama, I was into horror. So um, working together we started to make uh, a number of shorts. Um, we'd alternate between the two, so he would work on a short with me, then I would work on a short with him and we alternated back and forth through a few films. So in 1996, the first film on which we worked together was a film called From Within the Woods. Now that was before I'd seen Within the Woods, the, the Evil Dead prototype. I just knew of the name from an article in City Fantastic. So there was no script, um, you know, no storyboarding. We basically just went to a local forest and I, we made it up as we went along. So I was the only character and my friend Will was the camera and sound man. Uh, the film, more or less, was about someone being chased through a forest by an Evil Dead-like entity. So we had POV shots, like an Evil Dead, and then shots of me running. And uh, we had a couple of different endings, one where I escape across the river, one where the entity runs onto a knife and then bleeds and falls over. Um, but we shot around 24 minutes of footage and edited it down to about uh, six minutes. Actually, about two years later, um, that would have been 1998, we attempted a reshoot of exactly the same thing, but uh, Will then had a Hi8 camera, which is higher quality than the camera he had before. But that camera developed a fault. When we were shooting, we got about 19 minutes into shooting it, and there was something wrong with it, I can't remember what it was. But I do remember um, I'd made a rig from a coping saw blade, uh, a coping saw frame, and uh, the camera would be housed at the bottom and then the coping saw frame would go around to the top and there'd be a little pulley and uh, I suspended it between two trees about probably 40 feet apart with some fishing line uh, down a gentle slope and I remember three or four times letting his camera go and travel down and Will was trying to catch it so before it hit the tree at the other end. Uh, as I say, the camera stopped working shortly after that. I'd like to think it was a coincidence but it probably wasn't. So after From Within the Woods, we um, worked on a short of Will's called Helen's 18th, which was a drama about a, a birthday party and relationships between people, as I said. And um, while I wasn't overly interested in the film itself, it was interesting to get, uh, there was probably about 20 people total in the cast and crew, probably four on the crew, and um, another 15 over a few weeks in various positions in the cast. And I did find it interesting to see how um, how to assemble people and how to get it to work and um, what you do if the, if the lead actor just decides not to turn up because it was obviously all un, all unpaid um, and that did happen a couple of times where you'd have seven or eight people ready to shoot on a Saturday morning and one of the actors just decides that they can't come and uh, how you manage with that, how you shift things around and it was just interesting to see that because obviously I'd only done a film with Will on our own at that point. Then in 1998, uh, we made a film of mine called Sugar Coated Razor Blades. Um, I can't remember where the title came from, but um, it was a film with no plot. Uh, it was just really an exercise in stringing a number of special effects that I knew I could do together. So things like uh, a fake gun, um, a trick machete, 
a retractable screwdriver and a knife, uh, and then my very first bullet hit, or, or a squib, you know, when someone gets shot. Uh, the bullet hit, actually, is something I would continue refining for another probably 10 years before I came up with the final version that I've got now, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, so I played the lead, Will was the cameraman and the sound man, and it was a much smaller scale than the previous short I did with uh, Will. And I had a few friends roped in to play the victims. Uh, we shot around 80 minutes of footage over three days, and the final edit came just under four minutes long. Uh, while a lot of the effects were crudely created, for example, the machete was made out of cardboard covered in uh, aluminium weatherproofing tape. I think some of them do hold up even now. Uh, around 2000, while on my um, theatre media production course, I did a week's work experience with a company called Emergency House in uh, Huddersfield. And they were a special general special effects company uh, that did everything from wind and rain effects to making moulds of things and reproducing prosthetics and things like that and they had just finished working on um, the BBC TV series League of Gentlemen. I remember in their office they had the beast creature but among other things they also had a crate of breakaway milk bottles, you know breakaway as in they're designed to break for film and TV like sugar glass. Uh, I mentioned uh, that I'd tried to make my own sugar glass using plaster moulds at college. I, I didn't have much success with that so one of the guys there, Mark, made a mould for me. Um, I was able to use that to make a few of my own bottles when I got back home uh, and film a little sequence with it. Coincidentally, I'd find myself working for the same company that made those breakaway bottles but about two years later. So once I um, finished college, I decided I needed to move to London if I was ever going to pursue a career in special effects. And over the course of about a year, I managed to get some special effects work. I remember working on a Sky TV commercial, um, a Faithless music video, and... Um, a BT uh, photo commercial. I made some gnomes for a photo commercial. But that was back at the point where I was didn't really have any experience. So in terms of working on something, it might be sanding something or painting something. It wasn't making it in its entirety because it didn't have an exper experience to do that. So in 2002, after a year of really struggling financially, I uh, happened to walk into a full-time job making breakaway stunt glass. Uh, that's glass that's made to break for film and TV so when you see someone on TV or in a film or a music video get hit over the head with a bottle or jump through a window that that's breakaway glass and that's what I do now um, I've been there for about 14 years now so we've got a catalogue of stock items that someone can just pick out of our catalogue and also if a production has a specific item that they need moulding um, they can give that to us and we would replicate it as a ceramic or a glass breakaway so over the years I've worked on um, things like the Harry Potter series, uh, the last five Bond films. When I joined the company we were just working on Die Another Day and then we've just finished doing stuff for Spectre. And then there's a number of recent Marvel films, I forget what they're all called, but um, the recent Marvel films shot in this country. The new Batman trilogy, uh, the Taken films, the Bourne films and then TV stuff like Game of Thrones and Doctor Who. But of all the productions I've supplied breakaways to over the years, probably the most exciting was Red Dwarf, which is something I grew up watching. Um, you might say why that, but uh, so many of the big films that come to us are either under fake names, so you don't know what it is, or um, you have a special effects company in charge of the special effects, so all we get is their name, not the, t not the film's name. Uh, and then obviously you have new films which you wouldn't know anyway even if you did know the title. Even now every so often I'll catch something on TV and think oh I made that um, but you know it can be six months between me making something and uh, something appear on TV or in film. Uh, since 2011 the company holds the world record for the largest breakaway glass structure which was driven through by a car. I remember being uh, there at the time filming it uh, on my mobile phone. Uh, a lot of the time we make stuff, send it out the door, and that's the end of our involvement. So you might make sheet glass for someone to jump through, but all you do is make it, put it in a box, and it goes out to wherever it's going. We send stuff all over the world. So 99% uh, of the stuff we never see it get used. Um, but that, that day we actually went there, fitted the stuff, and um, got to see the car drive through the, uh, the glass, and it was quite exciting to see. So with a stable job and... Um, 
a stable income and the tools um, to be able to do it, I started working on my own special effects again. Uh, up to that point, I had been working on things, but it was either very small scale or just on paper, just simply because um, I wasn't able to do it for one reason or another. So I was able to start making things like uh, retractable screwdrivers, a retractable straight razor, a rubber hammer and an axe, and um, retractable knives. And um, this retractable knife is based on a design I came up with probably seven or eight years ago. And I only made this um, uh, probably about six months ago for a film. But um, you can see from the back, uh, there's a lot of workings to it. But from the front, you can't see any of that. And there is a join there. Uh, but once the uh, knife is moving fast enough, you can't see that at all. Uh, so that's a retractable knife. Probably the best effect I've made to date has been a trick machete, which builds upon the effect that Tom Sabini used in Dawn of the Dead. Uh, that involves a, a real machete with a, a section cut out of the blade, which you can place against someone's head. Um, and then it, uh, you know, it looks like you've got a real machete and a real head, and it creates a very good effect. Because when you use a fake head, it's very, very easy to tell that it's a fake head. Whereas if you use a real person's face, that, that immediately creates a much better effect. Uh, the design I came up with uses exactly the same idea, uh, a blade with a hole cut in it, but the blade can move back and forth. So where the hole stays still, you can saw back and forth on something like someone's head or neck, and you've got a real blade, a real face, real neck, but also the blade's moving back and forth, making an effect that looks very, very realistic and um, uh, very hard for your brain to work out. <laughs> I also continued to develop the uh, the squib from the first one on to put razor blades into a system using compressed air. So um, see, that took about 10 years of working on and putting money into buying new bits, then refining that and then starting again and refining that. Um, the hardest element of the system was the entry squib, which is uh, where the bullet enters someone and you get a fine spray of blood along with a trickle of blood coming out. Um, and it did take quite a few years to get that right, to get what I was looking for. Uh, but the entire system, um, which I worked out other bits too, you could have an entrance squib, like we say, and then an exit squib, so you get a splat on a wall or, or a spray coming out behind someone. Um, and then you could have uh, a shotgun entry wound. You can also have puffs of smoke, so that could go on a, a wall, say, to look like bullet ricochets. And the good thing about it was that there was no explosives or electrical wiring involved, so you could reset it really quickly and it wasn't dangerous. I mean, the worst that would happen is you could squirt blood in someone's eye, but you were never gonna take your fingers off with a little little debt or something like that. Uh, as part of that system, I copied an idea from the Night of the Living Dead remake, which was uh, forehead or skin bullet hits, where they would take a marble, make a mold of it, reproduce a breakaway version, fill that with fake blood and use a blowgun to blow that at someone or something so working in breakaway gas and making molds i uh, was something i knew how to do so i decided to have a go at that myself and that's how i got this this mark here um as i say i turned up the compressor as high as it would go and got someone to fire it at me right, go on. Ow. Uh, so making all these special effects is um how evil dead chainsaws first came about actually um uh in 2002 uh, I bought a home light XL chainsaw on eBay, uh, a real working one, and I modified it slightly to uh, match the chainsaw in Evil Dead 2. So around 2005, um, I, w I was talking to a friend about this and showing them the various things I was making, uh, and he said, um, why don't I try and sell some of this stuff? Now at the time I looked around, looking at various websites, and I came across Nightmare Gloves, which is a uh, website which at the time was run by a Danish guy called Anders, and he made replica gloves of the Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, Freddy Krueger gloves. And we got into conversations, email conversations, about how, how uh, he set things up, how he dealt with things like copyright and the financial aspects of it. And um, he gave me the idea to try and do something similar, so find not a special effect, but a prop that I could make and replicate a number of times and set up a website selling them. So, um, after some more research, I just settled upon the chainsaw from Evil Dead 2. 
Uh, so the chainsaw I already had, the one I bought in about 2002, I took it apart uh, and started prototyping the idea and it took me from about May to December 2005 until I knew I'd got something I, I could sell and it would work. Um, and I launched the website in December 2005. Um, I decided I wanted to do three modern chainsaws. The first was the workshed chainsaw. Um, the second was the cabin chainsaw and the medieval chainsaw. Um, the medieval chainsaw is based on the chainsaw from Army of Darkness. And the workshed and cabin chainsaws are both from Evil Dead 2 because the continuity is so bad in Evil Dead 2. Although it's supposed to be the same chainsaw all the way through, uh, there are quite big differences sometimes from shot to shot. So I made two chainsaws, the one that was more or less the one that was made in the uh, workshed uh, scene between Annie and Ash. And then the chainsaw, give it a take, that featured after that in the film. It was always my intention to do a different backdrop, a different photo backdrop for each of the three chainsaws. Um, because of one thing or another, I only ever made the workshed backdrop. And the workshed backdrop I made back then wasn't horrendously accurate. It was just cobbled together as quickly as I could do it. Um, there was no research into what props were there. Uh, I just went from screenshots from the, the, the DVD um got roughly what i could assemble very cheaply and then just cobbled a load of other things wine bottles plant pots you know um buckets of paint things like that um just to fill it in and that was the workshop backdrop and i'd wanted to do a uh, cabin backdrop for the cabin chainsaw which i had a couple of ideas for but um it was probably going to be a uh the table where the tape player is and the uh you know the lamp and what have you but um, one thing or another, I just never got to that. I did start uh, making a sculpt of the Book of the Dead cover, uh, but that was as far as I got with that idea. And once I decided not to do it, I didn't even finish the, the sculpt, which took me quite a while. So um, after I'd started Evil Dead Chainsaws, I found out about the, um, the Toronto run of Evil Dead the Musical. I think that was the first run, uh, or the first run I knew of. And I got in touch with them around uh, December 2005 just to see if they'd be interested in buying one of my chainsaws. Um, they actually emailed back at the time and said, we're well underway, we've got a chainsaw, we've got a chainsaw, we know that works, we're happy with it. So um, they wanted to stick with that rather than chop and change mid-production. Mid in May of 2006, which is um, about five, five months later, I actually got an email from them out of the blue. Uh, asking about supplying a chainsaw for the upcoming uh, New York run. Um, and to date, I've supplied chainsaws to that run. Uh, 2007 Toronto run, 2008 Korean run, and also Tom Sullivan has one of my chainsaws in his Evil Dead, Travelling Evil Dead Museum. Uh, that, I think, is one of the chainsaws that I first supplied to Evil Dead, the musical in New York. But um, his, his one is really, really quite battered. Uh, you, you know, working in a musical, they'll fall over, they'll drop a chainsaw and, you know, you do that enough times, you'll break just about anything. So in total, over the time I was running Evil Dead Chainsaws, that at that point I'd sold about 14, with actually with nine going to Evil Dead the Musical productions of one sort or another. Uh, by 2008, I'd decided to close Evil Dead Chainsaws. Um, Evil Dead the Musical, with each run, we give them feedback on the chainsaws, so what what was broken, what parts needed replacing, and each time I was adding in revisions to each new chainsaw I was making for customers and for them. So um, with each of these revisions, um, the time that make each chainsaw was getting longer and longer. Uh, one of my first reasons for starting Evil Dead Chainsaws was to give me sp some spare pocket money, as it were, to spend on special effects so rather than sinking my own money into things I was able to spend that money on doing special effects and doing extra things but because I had no spare time because I was making chainsaws I obviously wasn't doing any special effects and the any spare money I did have I'd be investing in tools and machinery to make better chainsaws so it was self-defeating I wasn't doing any other special effects and uh, you know the money I had was being invested back into the chainsaws as it was no longer needed the um, the huge workshop photo backdrop display in my workshop which was probably eight feet it was like a table with the display on top of it so it was a table about four feet high and then another three feet of display on top of that and it was about eight feet wide so it was really quite big 
um, and I didn't want to just get rid of it because I put a, quite a bit of time on it even if it wasn't hugely accurate so I chopped it down so it was probably three foot by four foot got rid of the table underneath and put it on legs so I could put it in my front room and then I could hang my own chainsaw uh, in the display and actually I sold that a few months later I think I um, sold just the chainsaw to a guy in uh, could have been Denmark but uh, anyway I sold the chainsaw and now I didn't have a chainsaw in any way to make it I make a new one to put in the display I just took apart the display in the end and, and that was the end of Evil Dead Chainsaws for the first time so later in 2008 I decided to have a go at making a fan made DVD an Evil Dead DVD called The Treasures Collection um, that came out of an earlier project um, in April roughly of 2008 I wanted to have a go at re-editing uh, re the Evil Dead uh, using some of the re raw footage featurettes so from the Ultimate Edition and from the um, Elite Raw footage on the DVD. Um, and I got halfway through that re-editing uh, and I discovered on the original Trilogy.com forums um, about the Herald Videogram Laserdisc version, the Japanese version, which had a very different colour timing to the, the Western versions. It was a lot more blue and people said it tended to be scarier because of that blue it made it feel colder and, and, and scarier so I managed to track this laser disc down in, in, in uh, Japan somewhere in Japan and ordered it um, and rather than going back to the editing project um, and re-editing with that that laser disc which is my original intention I decided that the laser disc itself the transfer from the laser disc itself would make a decent enough project in itself and that became the Treasures Collection DVD and the entire project from start to finish took about six months. Uh, the extras on there were drawn from uh, the rarest material I had at the time. I didn't want to just stuff it with extras that were available on DVD that people would already have. So I put the best version of Within the Woods I had on there. Uh, the four minute work print trailer of Evil Dead Book of the Dead it was, as it was called back then. Um, and then a DVD ROM folder um, with, with lots of digital stuff on there. Uh, the motion menu, as I mentioned before, did take, I think it take a, took a good few weeks to complete. Um, what I finally settled on was um, like an image of the, the cabin floor uh, with film cans on it. Um, and you'd use that to choose what you wanted to watch. And I added a soundtrack and lightning and um, the, the fire burning and the uh, clock ticking and then the um, uh, the swing, the swing outside the cabin, banging against the wall, uh, various effects, and uh, I think it comes across pretty well. Uh, then the following year, I started Book of the Dead. Actually, the original idea came out of um, uh, an, another older project uh, within the woods.co.uk. is a British Evil Dead fan site that had been on the internet one form or another since probably the early 90s. Uh, in 2005, that site went offline, leaving only a holding page in the forums, but I'd had a, a saved backup version of the website, so I, I still knew it was uh, you know, a perfectly worthy website. And it did have some rare things on there that I'd not seen on other Evil Dead websites, and it did seem like the guy that ran it um, searched things out and, and wanted to present things that had not been seen on the internet before. Uh, in June 2009, I got a forum email from Mark, the guy that, guy that ran the website, um, with he had plans to re resurrect the site and I emailed him back and offered to help and he agreed. So over a number of months um, I redesigned the site's artwork and the layout to an extent, um, added new content and he also he did bits as well but it did seem after a while that I w my, my heart was in it and his wasn't. So I thought by September, so that was probably three months later of working on his website, I thought well rather than slogging my guts off for someone else who isn't putting in as much work as I am, I thought I'd just recycle everything I'd done into my own website. So um, I changed the titles on all the graphics to uh, Book of the Dead from from Within the Woods and uh, stuck with the same um, layout and started just adding my own, my own bits and pieces. Uh, before settling on Book of the Dead, uh, as a title for the website I came up with quite a list of others um, there was uh, coffee, milk and caro syrup uh, blood and gasoline weeds gone bad remember to dismember uh, grave consequences uh, super duper 8 
total bodily dismemberment, behind the screams, um, number one nasty, which refers to a quote by Margaret Thatcher, uh, farewell to arms, and uh, one which is a, a one I did really like was called Some Assembly Required. Some people being chopped up. But anyway, I went for Book of the Dead because that was the most obvious and I wanted a title that people would immediately associate or people in the know would associate with Evil Dead. Uh, I've interviewed a fair list of people over the years. Um, the first one I managed to get was Tim Quill uh, back in 2012. I tracked down and did a rather crackly telephone interview with him. But it was uh, the first time that um, an Evil Dead had, website had an interview with him and it was quite exciting to get. And since then, I've done uh, about 20 people. So I've done Bruce and Don Campbell, Scott Spiegel, who was a really nice guy, and I spoke to on the phone for about four hours. Um, Tom Sullivan, Josh Becker, who's always really helpful if I've got a question about Evil Dead, or um, you know, he's done two interviews with me, and if I've got a question, I could just email him, and he'll normally come back to me. Uh, Ted Ramey, Rich Domenico, um, Danny Hicks, and Howard Berger, Robert Kurtzman, Shannon Shea. Mark Shostrom, um, Rick Katzom, Cheryl Guthridge from Super 8 Films, on Evil Dead, uh, Bart Pierce and Bill Ward. And there's been a couple of other people I've tried to get in contact with and who either didn't want to do it for, for one reason or another, who I, I've never been able to track down. In 2011, I completed a project to identify all the music cues used in Within the Woods. Uh, the last two, I only identified through Scott Spiegel during his interview. Um, I've been looking for those for a few years. Uh, also, uh, I've started keeping a list of cues used across some of the Super 8 short films. Uh, that That's just bits and pieces I've come across and managed to identify quite easily, so that's nowhere near as comprehensive. Uh, another little addition to the site is the Video Nasties Newspaper Story Scans Research Project. Uh, I did that during 2012, uh, and that's designed to be a, like a free, comprehensive resource, PDF resource. Um, with over 300 pages of newspaper scans all on the theme of video nasties. Uh, they run from about, uh, say, late 1980 up to 2008, and they're all copied from microfilm from the British Library newspapers in North London. Then in 2012, I made the Book of the Dead DVD, which is um, what most people will know as the fan-made DVD that I've made. Uh, which grew out of the Evil Dead Treasure Collection DVD, which I mentioned before, and the re-edit of the Evil Dead which never got past that first few uh, bits and pieces that I did. Uh, in August 2010, um, Anchor Bay released the Blu-ray transfer of Evil Dead, and that um, did outshine the, the earlier Laserdisc transfer. It had that blue tint, the framing was more or less identical, and obviously the quality was much better. So before even before getting it, I would knew from various forums that there was some digital correction on the Blu-ray. So using the Blu-ray along with the um, theatrical DVD version on the Anchor Bay open map versions, I re-edited the film and uh, reverted all the, the tweaks and changes. So when it came to a tweak or a change, I would cut back to the DVD version. And because I was outputting a DVD version rather than a Blu-ray version, by the time you'd re-encoded everything, it matched pretty well. I did have to do some colour correction, but it matched pretty well. So I was also able to conclude an upgraded version of Within the Woods which was also had an uh, isolated score track. Um, the previous Book of the Dead trailer added on. I could add in six deleted scenes, which I added from the, um, from the raw footage, and obviously a couple of deleted scenes that I'd made uh, on the very first version of the project, um, along with some Super 8 shorts, which I've now got, It's Murder and Clockwork, and... Um, a TV an, uh, interview with Tom Sullivan. Being a two disc set, I recycled the menus from the Treasures Collection into the first disc, but I had to make some new menus for the second disc. Um, I'd come up with a range of ideas in the original um, DVD for menu ideas. Um, something like the cabin, bathroom, the bedrooms, the car, the bridge, forest floor, uh, leaves, um, you know, just settings for, 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 the, for the menu. And in the end, I settled on the cellar, the table in the cellar with the Book of the Dead and the, um, uh, the shotgun and what have you. And I cobbled that together with either screenshots or photos of original items uh, in Photoshop and also animated to an extent. In uh, December 2012, I took a holiday to America to film footage at nine locations used in the filming of Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2. I identified nine locations. 
Um, there was a tenth I identified after I got back, but I didn't have a chance to film there. So I flew from the UK into Knoxville Airport in Tennessee and stayed in a hotel next to the airport for that evening. That was a Wednesday evening. And then the next day I got a hire car and drove straight from there to the cabin site. Uh, that was in Morristown, about 60 miles away. Uh, the initial cabin visit I broke up into two, two, two visits, as it were. Um, that was because I wanted to go and get some souvenirs first, take them back to the car, and then go and do the filming. Uh, obviously, uh, equally, both things were, were important, but I knew that if, if I got caught and had, um, you know, was carrying out armfuls of rocks and what have you, then I'd probably be made to put them back. Whereas if I, had, I was walking out and had a camera, chances are, you know, I might be escorted off the premises, but, you know, I, 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 w I wouldn't lose the footage. Uh, so I parked at the gas station, way down on the main road, which I thought was fairly close, looking at Google Earth to the, to the cabin site, which actually turned out to be a two mile walk. So um, I walked all the way up there, had a look around. There was no one there. So I um, took some chimney rocks some leaves, soil, bits of tin roof, things like that and put everything in my backpack and walked back to the car, which with probably 30 kilos of rocks and dirt and what have you, was, was not, a, not a pleasant walk. But anyway, I got back to the car and then drove up and parked just beyond the cabin entrance. Um, and um, when you're there, there's the cabin entrance there and there's houses here, but beyond there, there's, there's nothing. So if you park up here, um, uh, you know, you're not visible from the houses. So uh, I parked up here and then walked down to the cabin. I spent about an hour filming the walk down the path, around the cabin side, different views up the hillside, uh, from the hillside and up the hillside, and never saw a soul there. All that's left now is a chimney stack um, and uh, some concrete foundations, what I think were concrete foundations, concrete on the floor anyway. Uh, the chimney stack, when I saw it, was probably about eight feet high, seven, eight feet high. And I saw to photos of it last year. It probably gone to about, to about six feet because everyone that comes there takes a, a brick, uh, and it just gets progressively shorter and shorter. Uh, the actual area itself was a lot smaller than I thought it would be. Um, seeing it on screen, you imagine it's quite big and quite spacious, but actually, um, you know, when you when you stand next to the fireplace, you know, the hill next to the cabin seems really quite close, and you always imagine how. It's hard to imagine how big the cabin would have been. Uh, you know, the cabin really must have been quite small to fit in the space. And obviously now that the cabin's not there, you've got trees growing out of where the cabin used to be. So the only thing that, that, that you've got there um, to know the cabin was ever there is the chimney stack. So then I drove around some of, the, some of the other locations seen on screen, some of the roads and what have you, before heading back to the hotel for the evening. And then the next day on the Friday, I went back to the cabin site to film more footage. I'd looked at my footage that I'd shot um, uh, the day before um, and thought, well, I, I'm, I'm here till lunchtime. I can film some more footage. Uh, so I probably did about another, uh, another hour's of worth of footage um, before driving onto the bridge. Uh, in the night, uh, it had rained slightly, so when you see my footage edit edited together, some of it looks bright and sunny and some of it looks a bit dreary and a bit rainy. Both times I was there, there was no one there at all, although the second time when I was filming on the hill, I could hear someone walking around, um, you know, out of sight, but it was quite sc scary to be there trying to get the filming done and hearing someone walking around behind me, because for all I know, someone's going to emerge with a shotgun and start shooting at me. But luckily nothing happened. I left and no one, no one so much as said a word to me. So once filming at the bridge, I then drove 260 miles over the Smoky Mountains. Uh, once in Wadesboro, I toured around uh, the Evil Dead filming location as well. Evil Dead 2 was shot. Um, so that was the J.R. Faison High School, which was used to house the cabin and cellar sets, interior sets, and also the crew and admin offices, workshops and special effects and things like that. Uh, and I also went to the the ballast pits, which we used um, in the clim climactic section of the film with the um, the uh, castle on the hillside. Uh, now there is no cliff, there's no, there is no hillside there now at the moment. Uh, the the place is completely flat and partially flooded, so it looks like a a moonscape with a lake in it. Uh, finally, I visited the cabin, the exterior cabin set, which still exists. This was only um, possible due to the fact that I. Uh, one of the Evil Dead crew members I knew got in touch with the previous owners of the cabin who got in touch with the current owners with the cabin who said I could film there. 
now the, the the cabin the cabin set isn't accessible to, to members of the public it's actually a large large bit of land that the uh, the people own and uh, the bit of trees which the cabin is in probably 100 or 150 yards across is in like a valley and it's got uh, electric fences all the way around it and the the fields around that are used for cattle farming so there's electric fences so you can't the cattle can't roam down into the the cabin area but that equally means you would have to go across land and then through a number of electric fences to get down there and they actually turned off the electric fences so i could go down there, th there and film back again but normally day to day the electric fences would be on to stop the cattle from roaming through the place uh, now when i was there um you could still walk through the cabin um the, the roof had started to bow quite a lot and there was uh, a bit which would have been over the kitchen had collapsed completely through completely and the floor most of the floor had collapsed but um, the main structure of the roof in the main rooms and across through to the back bedrooms was in one piece and you could walk completely through the whole thing I, I'm not entirely sure how much stuff was whether whether the set in um, the exterior set was completely dressed and then how much stuff the, the production took away for reshoots um, but when I was there the the inside was virtually entirely empty uh, the front and back doors are gone. I know who's got those. Um, and there was no furniture in there at all. So the only thing left were walls, floor, ceiling. Uh, there was one or two interior doors and, um, you know, rubbish, essentially. Now, with those internal doors, I knew uh, there was a maximum size limit to what I could take on the plane. So I was never going to get those on the plane. But I did take so much other stuff. I, I, I left the place with you know, big armfuls of stuff, which I managed to pack in a suitcase. So, um, um, those various bits of wood, I remember snapping a bit of wood off the, um, off the work shed, off the side of the workshop. It was already more or less snapped and I just helped it a bit and got a big long section of wood. Um, uh, and then there was wood from the inside of the cabin, the walls, the slats of the walls of the cabin and, um, you know, various other bits and, uh, trees and, bits of the, the the styrofoam trees there and and what have you in looking around um i thought about taking one of the back door steps um but there was only one left and it was really quite big it was really quite long and it was completely rotted through so i just thought it wasn't worth taking that but uh, that would have been nice to have if there'd been one of those that wasn't rotten i did also take um if you watch the film as the force comes uh up to the back of the cabin and goes into the cabin you can see uh logs a pile of logs next to the back door they're all they were all rotten as well but i actually took one off the top uh that wasn't as bad as of um may 2014 uh producer director dan sellers got in contact to say the evil dead 2 cabin and completely collapsed uh and he said the fake trees are still there uh and the woodshed is still standing when i when i saw it there it was really pretty sturdy but the cabin uh it is collapsed completely on itself so you can't walk through it so it's nice that I got footage of the inside of the cabin before it collapsed completely. So on the following day, on the Sunday, I drove to the airport, uh, which was uh, the Anson County Airport, um, um, before driving on to Charlotte to catch my flight home. Uh, from each of the locations I went to, even the, the roads and what have you, um, I collected bits and pieces. So I ended up with 30 kilos of souvenirs. So everything from rocks and trees, bits of wood, what, what have you. Um, and I took a quite a big empty suitcase just for that purpose when i came back through heathrow it was 5 a.m and the place was deserted so i just wheeled straight through and got in a taxi and came home so then following that december visit in january i decided to make a glass display case for all the bits i'd brought back um just to explain um prior to that i'd never been one for collecting physical items you know you've got some people out there who collect you know, every everything under the sun, you have dead lunch boxes, all the comics, you know, flasks and things like that, or earrings, and it's not really been my, my thing. I obviously had a few DVD versions and then a couple of Evil Dead books. Uh, but, but starting that glass display case um, and having that in, in, in my house uh, made me want to add bits to it. And then I tracked down other props and started collecting other things. And pretty much all my collection I've got um, is has been made up since 2012, December of 2012. So that's uh, 30, 40, 15, so three years. Um, just coming up to three years and I've managed to build up all those bits. And there's been quite a few bits I've seen and go over the years, which, um, uh, you know, I wish I'd collected. Like I know the um, uh, the map painting for Evil Dead 2, the map painting of the bridge, 
came up for sale on eBay in about 2000 and probably three or four, um, you know, huge map painting. And um, uh, now I would bid on that, but at the time I, I wasn't really that bothered. Uh, a couple of bits worth worth noting in my collection are the, the Book of the Dead replica I've got, uh, which was made in 20, probably 2013 by a Danish guy called Jesper. Um, he also made that along with some, some lost pages um, and a replica of the clock drawing that sh Tom Sullivan did for, for Ellen in, in The Evil Dead. Um, and the Book of the Dead replica I got from him, uh, he's made his own copy and as far as I know that's it. And um, uh, it's probably the best best fan made replica I've seen. Uh, I've also tracked down a number of identical items, I say identical as in um, on screen you see you see a, whatever a projector or a lamp and figure out what it is um, and then and then tracked it down and bought one so as I mentioned the projector the shells box the uh, the lamp the necklace the magnifying glass necklace the tape player the the chainsaws etc so I've figured out what they are um, and tracked them down and, bro and bought them from America mostly I also had help from a friend in Tokyo and Japan to buy, buy a lot of Japanese items uh, it's things like magazines to scan them from the websites but also DVDs and videos and flyers and things like that um, I've always found uh, Japanese artwork quite um, quite a draw uh, you know you can get Western VHS covers and it just seems to be a photo and a bit of text whereas um, uh, a Japanese DVD or, 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 or flyer or what have you could be almost a little work of art aside from warning uh, you know many of the widely available retail items that many many people alone like dvds books blu-rays and what have you i i have got a very small number of very rare pieces that includes some book of the dead uh, 1981 premiere promo items so so that's a program um two tickets and a flyer the flyer i got off um josh becker along with the program uh, the program I've seen on, on eBay a number of times, probably two or three times in the last 10 years, but the flyer, that's the only time I've seen it, is from Josh Becker, other than um, in the gallery section of one of the DVD, Evil Dead DVDs. I was also contacted by someone, um, I won't say who, and um, we struck up a conversation and it transpired that uh, that person had a box of old slides and uh, photos from Evil Dead. Uh, a lot of them are original, they're postmarked as... Uh, 1979 or 1980 being developed in so um uh, i arranged to buy that box off that person and uh that's that's something else i've got and obviously i've got my um evil dead souvenirs as well probably the rarest thing i own is actually a scrap of paper from 1979 uh which has bruce campbell's handwritten driving directions from the cabin to knoxville airport which was given to josh becker so he could make that drive for the first time to pick up their film stock as I say, it's just a scrap of paper, but it's, um, you know, a little bit of Evil Dead history. I've also got quite a decent collection of pretty rare video material. Um, a, a lot of it's not been released on DVD before. Um, as well as the Super 8 shorts released on DVD by Josh Becker and, and some of the others on, on various European DVD releases. I've also got um, Clockwork, It's Murder, uh, Shem Pete's the Moon, Six Months to Live, uh, William Shakespeare the movie and and uh, within the woods um, I've also got some rarer Evil Dead items transferred from a pair of VHS tapes I borrowed from a US van a couple of years back um, also a few hours of Greg Nicotero's Evil Dead 2 behind the scenes camcorder footage um, and some of Vern Hyde's footage and uh, as well as a DVD covering the whole of the Evil Dead 2 talent show I've also got a low quality version of the Evil Dead 2 TV version edit, um, which has around 11 minutes of new and alternate footage. Um, most recently I traded with another fan to get a set of DVDs containing over four hours of raw Evil Dead footage. Um, that includes different and longer takes of things that were in the film, as well as some completely new footage as well. Uh, around the start of 2013 I decided to create a replica of the clock seen in Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2, and, and an Army of Darkness in the remake. Although I knew what the clock was, um, you know, the maker and what have you, um, it, it was still a, quite a rare antique. Uh, so I assembled the, um, the, the facade from, from wood and uh, glass and went for a, um, a modern clock mechanism, a silent clock me mechanism, because you can get them with a swinging pendulum. And that was because uh, 
I've got a small open plan flat and I didn't want a real clock mechanism ticking, which would tick quite, quite loudly, and also chiming. Um, it took us around um, about three weeks to make and cost about £125. And there are still a few points that I'm not 100% happy with. The varnish ended up being a bit too shiny, but other than that, it's, it's, it's a decent enough replica. Following on from that, in July in 2015, I made a um, replica of the Kandaran dagger from the first film. The whole dagger took about uh, two days to make and cost £84. And I made it pretty much in the same way that uh, Tom Sullivan made his. In his interview, he, he, he elaborates on how he made it. Um, although, apart from an a aluminium blade, I used a steel one. The most expensive elements of the dagger were um, the two visible man kits. Uh, Tom used a couple of those kits, various bits from those kits, um, on, on the, on the uh, handle along with some chicken bones. Uh, the blade was made of cellu clay, which is um, quite a um, soft substance. So forming it and getting it to stay on the blade was not easy because as I was forming it, it was sort of starting to sag down. And I was trying to keep it upright and hang it upside down, which then may sag that way. And it was quite a fluid, fluid thing. So um, uh, that was all a bit fraught and, and, and getting the exact right um, hilt was not easy when, when it's sagging down and sagging that way and that way. So the version I put together was was a pretty good approximation of the, the real one. Obviously, mine looks a lot more aged than the one on screen, which looks very clean. The blade is clean. The blade is bright and shiny. Uh, you know, a lot of the bones are white, bright white and shiny, whereas I made a, uh, you know, aged everything down, rust the blade. Other little replica projects I've worked on are things like um, uh, making a screen accurate wooden glass box for my uh, Book of the Dead replica, uh, a recreation of the Farewell to Arms uh, cover, dust cover from Evil Dead 2, um, replica of the cabin keys from the Evil Dead and um, uh, the necklace box from Evil Dead as well. Uh, in 2013, I decided to revisit Evil Dead Chainsaws. By that point, I was uh, happy to have another go at it, and then obviously I had to start completely from scratch. All the modes had been trashed. Uh, all I had was my book of um, notes, and that was it. So I didn't have any of the original templates. Uh, you know, I had a template for every little bracket and every bit. I could just put a template down, draw around it, draw where the holes were, cut it out, drill the holes, and that was it. And I had to start all that from scratch. And I, I should have kept bits, but I never thought I would need them again. I started the prototyping around April 2013. Uh, I'd been contacted by, by various people over the years, and I got back to people and lined up three people who wanted a chainsaw uh, and used their money to pay for all the prototyping. Um, and I completed those three orders and did all the prototyping around uh, probably about nine weeks later. Uh, that would have been the start of June. That was all done a lot quicker than the first time because I more or less knew what I was doing, uh, in, both in terms of general processes like making moulds. I'd, I'd got better at over the years and also making these chainsaws specifically because I'd spent so much time making them. I had all the notes. I wasn't having to really work things out too much anymore. It was just a matter of getting it done. So for the most part, these new saws look virtually identical to the old ones, um, from, from the outside at least. Um, but there have been, internally, there have been some quite big tweaks um, and with, with, with all the revisions, there's a generally stronger construction and a more accurate construction to the original chainsaw. Uh, the various painting and waging processes were all refined and uh, I think the, the chainsaws now come, aloft, come across as more polished than, than the older ones did. Uh, so in addition to that, I um, also as a special project for a customer in May of uh, 2014. I did a replica of the Army of Darkness mechanical arm, which is not something I set out to do originally. I wasn't really that bothered about um, making that arm because it was basically starting from scratch and something I'd never done before. Um, but it, it did take me a few months, but I got that made and I've sold another three since. Uh, as of the end of 2015, when I'm filming this, um, I've sold uh, 25 replicas and they've been sent all over the world. I haven't sent any more to Evil Dead the musical, um, but so those 25 replicas, including the mechanical arms, are all to private collectors. Uh, this time round, um, I decided to go ahead with the idea of making a different backdrop for each chainsaw. Uh, so you've got the, the, the workshop backdrop, um, exactly as it was before, but it's a lot more accurate this time. I did research into what, what, what each bit was and tracked a lot of bits down from America and then filled in the rest with with um, lightly bits and pieces. The um, 
the display looks far more accurate than the original one did and I was obviously able to, to, to make it over a, a lot longer period so make a much better job of it. And then I was able to fulfill the idea I had originally of making a um, cabin backdrop so uh, a piece of the workshop wall with a, um, uh, with a cupboard on it and then uh, the table with various items now because I've been collecting bits and pieces it wasn't that hard to, to populate it with the lamp which I'd already got the book of the dead the dagger of the dagger which I'd made um, uh, you know the lost pages you know various bits and pieces that I'd already got I could just populate it with that and it wasn't that hard to make um, the medieval chainsaw uh, I struggled for quite a long time you know, as to what the backdrop should be but in the end I just came up with some rubble like um, like the quarry uh, at the start of Army of Darkness um, and that for what it is it looks okay but it's not not anything amazing uh, in February of 2015 I was contacted by Ash vs Evil Dead uh, the production in New Zealand um, and I supplied them four non-working and then two working medieval style chainsaws so these were all assembled as in put together but they had no painting or aging on them because they wanted to do, the, do that themselves um, and also there was a rough stunt so I just cobbled together out of some, some odd bits. Um, it was only after the order was completed that um, rights issues became apparent. Uh, they didn't have the rights to use Army of Darkness and then further to that Bruce's stuntman who had quite large hands, Bruce has large hands as well but not as big, um, had trouble getting his hand into the chainsaws so um, they had to re reorientate the inside of the chainsaw to actually fit his hand in. So that combined with the copyright issues meant they basically had to completely disassemble all of my chainsaws and start from scratch, reor reorientating the interior, um, changing the outer look to negate the copyright issues. Um, so I know they'd used modified parts from my original chainsaws cobbled together to make their first prototype chainsaw, which they got clearance on and, and everyone was happy with. And then once they got that prototype chainsaw sorted, then they remolded all the parts to make their own chainsaws. So unfortunately that meant that uh, they'd remade every single part of the chainsaw that I'd provided them. So there are no original parts on the chainsaws you see on screen uh, from my original chainsaws. Between making those six chainsaws, two working ones which took an awfully long time to do, and um, making another six chainsaws for, for, for customers um, meant that I'd made 12 chainsaws by the middle of 2015 which was double the amount I'd made the previous two years. You know, I didn't mind um, doing the odd one every few months, but that was more than two a month. And getting up at five o'clock in the morning uh, to do chainsaws for three hours, then starting work uh, for another eight hours just is no fun at all. And again, because it takes up all of your spare time when you're that busy, um, you haven't got time to just work on other things. So um, in the last few weeks, I've scaled back my workshop and as of August 2015, I'm taking a break from Evil Dead Chainsaws. Um, maybe I'll come back to it and maybe I won't, so we'll just have to see. Uh, in 2014, I was getting a bit restless and decided to get back to making short films. Um, the first short film I made uh, was a short called uh, Who Is This Who Is Coming? which is about a woman who finds herself in a forest, finds a ring and puts it on and then uh, that summons an evil entity which chases her, which is somewhat like um, From Within the Woods and also based on a BBC short story from 1960, uh, 1960-something-or-other, um, called Whistle and I Come to You, about a guy who finds a whistle and then ends up dreaming about um, being chased by a, an evil entity. So um, really this, this served as a test to work out any kinks with my new camera and new camera equipment before I was making any larger scale films involving a wider group of people. Um, and that able because uh, I was working with a camera with which took different lenses. You could fit different lenses, thirty five millimeter lenses to it. Also, you had things like exposure, working out the right exposure, and um, uh, it was quite easy to film something, look at the camera, think you've got it right, and, and end up editing it and realizing you've got it overexposed. And once you have it overexposed, that's very very hard to correct uh, to get it looking right again. So um, I wanted to really get to give to the camera and. Um, get happy with it before I worked on something larger. Um, the following year I made a film called The Lateness of the Hour, uh, the title of which comes from uh, a Twilight Zone, an old Twilight Zone episode. It's nothing to do with the, the episode itself but I like the like the um, the title. 
So this is a short film set in a zombie outbreak, uh, which follows two characters as they try and escape. And, um, you know, it is a low budget production, so you're not saying Hordes of the Undead, but um, it's as good as I can make it for virtually no money. You know, no one got paid for it. And um, I got uh, local actors from various theatre companies and, um, you know, things like that. So the, the, no one involved was paid. and. Any, any anything that did cost any money came out of my own pocket making the props and things like that that's what the um the retractable knife was for in the same vein as sugar-coated razor blades it was intended to be um more of a special effect showcase originally as i came up with it but actually the film extended way beyond that so the special effects only happen in the, in the last minute or two of the film and the rest of it is um you know there's a lot more to it uh one of the effects i made for uh the lateness of the hour was a retractable tire iron I've wanted to do that since I saw uh, Night of the Living Dead, the original or the remake. They both use the same, same, pretty much the same thing. But um, uh, this is the effect itself. Uh, there was actually three versions of this. This is the uh, retractable version, and there was a complete version, and then a cut-off version. Um, so this has a uh, collapsible end. The third is collapsible, so you can push it into itself and it's spring loaded it also has a plunger here so this section here would be full of fake blood and as it's pushed in the flake fake blood would be squirted out of holes in the end here so it's all fairly self-contained and all you have to do is push it in blood comes out and then as you pull it out because it's spring loaded it, it, it reverts back to its full length again in roughly around 2004 i came up with a a zombie script which I worked on for probably a year or two um, but I would have needed lots of people to make that work which just wasn't going to happen especially since I'd not made a short film in years at that point so once I'd come up with the idea of the lateness of the hour um, it took a few months to get all the effects together and whatnot get storyboarded get the the, the actors and the crew in place so uh, by January of this year I was ready to go and uh, it took eight days to shoot um, over probably about a month or two I have been thinking about doing an Evil Dead inspired short film for quite a while, but um, you know I've got a lot of the sets, set pieces I would need, the props I would need to do it, but I'm just not overly keen on getting the props I've spent time making or tracking down or a lot of money tracking down, getting covered in blood and ruined. So um, I'm just not sure about that at the moment. Um, a lot of the fan films I've seen, you have someone else playing Ash uh and it's just never the same no matter how good a job they make of it so if i came up with a film which was maybe set in the evil dead universe but didn't involve any of the characters the established characters that could maybe work but um even before evil dead i've always had a huge drive to make things and be creative and i think between seeing the evil dead at the right age which steered my life and direction in the drive that drive um it's given me a pretty interesting life so far um, you know, as, as of recording, I've got a full-time job in special effects. I'm still experimenting with my own special effects and short films. I run Evil Dead Chainsaws um, and Book of the Dead. And um, I've made a number of replica props, Evil Dead props um, and DVDs. Um, I visited the Evil Dead shooting locations. Um, and I've obviously got a fair Evil Dead collection as well. Uh, that said, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more interesting stuff to come. I'm only uh, 35. You get to my age and you forget. <laughs>